this brief presentation, I just wanted to touch uh, on a few uh, tips about the pasture management. Um, so with that, let me see, okay. Okay, um, so uh, the, when we're talking about the pasture management, it's a whole lot of things included in the pasture management. And of course, I'm not gonna talk about all of these components, but um, so as we go from the, from the base to the top, um, the importance of the components um, um, becomes limited. So the very uh, the, the most important thing to the pasture management is soil fertility in terms of liming, uh, fertilization, and that sort of things. But that is not um, that is not the subject of this uh, brief presentation. But that is very very important because, um, uh, as you probably know, there are a lot of uh, farmers that they. Uh, they don't really uh, add lime or fer fertilization to their hay crops or pastures. Um, today, I'm just going to give you a very uh, a few tips about the grazing management. So, um, again, um, I'm not going to touch about the soil and soil fertility and soil testing and that sort of things, which are the major and the, the, uh, the major thing to the pasture management. So the pasture, if it's done right, um, is the best thing that may happen to animals um, and environment and uh, human beings. This is a picture that shows it all. The, 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 uh, the grasses are feeding the animals. Animals are happy and they, they sequester carbon. They bring in carbon from the atmosphere. But what we don't see is that, that those grasses are feeding the soil and the soil, um, which is full of life, really require um, the, the materials and the compounds that are released by the living roots. And so those pastures not only feed the animals above the ground, but they also feed the um, living organisms in the soil. Um, but it could be the worst enemy. Um, as you can see, the, the uh, the overgrazed uh, situations, whether it's a horse farm or the cow, uh, that is the probably one of the major enemies to the environment. And uh, this algae bloom is just one of them, okay? So the question is how overgrazing happened? Um, well, uh, the, it happens because uh, we sometimes we forget that the, that the pastures, pasture plants are not growing at the same rate throughout the year. You know, uh, sometimes uh, they are growing very, very rapidly and uh, they may reach 100% of their growth. But however, during the month of uh, summers, like August, July, August, um, we have summer slump and also we have some kind of um, sh shortfall during the fall. The, the problem is a lot of people, including horse owners and others, they consider the pastures uh, and they treat them, um, you know, uniformly. They don't care about if it's a summer or if it's a fall or it's a, it's a, it's a spring. So that is the beginning of uh, harming the pastures. So um, as long as we have the high, uh, high growth uh, growth rate of the pastures, we're good to go. However. If we keep the same number of animals for the same period of time grazing, then probably we're, we're going to be uh, we are going to be in trouble. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that, uh, unfortunately, a lot of farmers don't pay attention is that the growth of the uh, pastures, like any other crop, is like a sigmoid, is like an S shape. Okay, it starts with a very slow growth rate. Okay until the plant reaches around three to four inches. And then after that, your, the, the plant enters a fast growth stage, okay? Now, if we cut the plant, if we cut the plant at this stage, like two, one and a half, one inch, or even two inches, or we let the animals graze it down to about one or two inches, it takes time. It takes 
um, many days to pass this this period and then in turn into the fast growth okay um they may look at the short-term benefit if you call it benefit to graze one or two uh, extra inches but they have to at the end of the day they have to pay for it so i want to show you a demonstration uh, which is i think it's a very eye-opening this research was done by university of kentucky extension and as you can see, uh, this is, so they, what they did, they cut the grasses uh, at two, um, at two highs. Um, uh, excuse me, is, is somebody talking? Somebody's talking. Okay, yeah, somebody's, yeah. So please mute the, yourself. Um, so anyways, so uh, yeah, as you can see, the, the one, one pot was cut at one inches and the other one at three and a half inches and th this is how it it happens so after the three days the one that was cut at three and a half started to regrow whereas the one that in one inches is still behind the growth and it, the, because it takes several days to pass that uh, very slow uh, slow rate of the growth um, stage so again day four day five and day six so now after a week as you can see, the, the one that was cut in three and a half inches, now they are several inches, whereas the one that was cut at one inches um, is just started to grow. And that is uh, that you can um, imply that this exactly the same thing to the field condition, okay? So um, yes, you, the, 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 if we cut it like a couple of inches lower, that means we have more grasses, but at the but we have to pay um, a, a significant price at the end of the day. So that is, again, another reason for overgrazing. Um, so there are, a, there are a few fundamental tips about the grazing. Uh, one of them is that we have to leave enough residues to, like I said, roughly about four inches. I mean, the five would be better, but at least four inches uh, for the supporting the fast regrowth okay that is one and the other thing um that and, the, and if you look at this this picture again that's eye-opening if you will if this the, the first two are the the grasses that have been grazed uh, around three four inches and the other two are grazed at lower height and you can see the volume of the roots that shows that these two are much, much healthier. And when we say healthier, that translates into um, tolerant to the drought condition, because now this volume of the uh, roots can tap into the uh, deeper moisture in the soil, whereas these two are very, very sensitive to the drought. And, um, and if, for instance, if, if we don't have a uh, rain for a, for a month or so, these will die, and once they die, you see those bare soils, okay? And uh, so that is uh, a major, major tip about the grazing. Uh, the, the other is that we need to leave, um, we need to give the plants uh, a break. We need to, after the grazing, you need, we need to give plants at a great time. This is what we call the resting period or recovery period. Um, um, the other thing is that the, when it comes to the grazing, there is, a, there is a simple calculation that we need to do in order to see how much, how much really we have. What is the inventory per field, per paddock, or whatever uh, section that we have? Um, on average, this is very average, uh, we should expect something like 250 pounds of dry matter per inch per acre. So if we have like 10, 10 inches of forage, 10 times 250, that translates into the 250 pounds. But you're not going to harvest the whole thing, right? So if you have 10 inches, you have to leave four. Now you have only six inches. So six times 250, uh, that's, this is how much we have. And then we need to select the number of animals based on what we have, okay? And therefore, we now we need we need to look at the demand of the animals each animal demands differently for for instance the horses 
require roughly about 3% of their body weight. So if a horse is a thousand, um, then they need about 30 pounds per acre, uh, sorry, 30 pounds dry matter per day, okay? So that shows how, uh, how that paddock or that field can uh, accommodate um, the number of animals that we have. Sheep is 4%, cows are 3%, and so forth. Um, so we need to look at the, the demand and in the inventory. So the resting period is another important thing. Unfortunately, it's not, it's not um, the same for all the months. It changes. Uh, for instance, uh, the, um, the, the plant requires much, much shorter recovery during the month of April and May. Whereas when you look at the September, this time of the year, um, it requires uh, 36 days or so. So based on, the, and these are the average for the New England. Um, so we have to make sure that we are going to give enough resting period uh, based on the month of the grazing um, to the plants in order to have a healthy pastures. Um, so I'm, I'm suggesting a very, a simple rotational grazing. Um, so if, if you, it doesn't have to be, your field doesn't have to be circle, of course, it could be rectangle, could be uh, whatever. Um, so I, I partitioned the field into six, uh, roughly the same size paddocks. And uh, therefore the animals can start grazing. In the, this is house number one. And so after based on the demand and based on the animals after six days we move them here and then there and there so after 30 days we go back okay so that means the this this one that, that was grazed first had 30 days recovery now you may say well how do you know maybe we don't need 30 maybe we need only 15 days or on the other side um, maybe we need more than 30 days well that's why we call it simple, right? So this is not really intensive rotational grazing. This is just a simple. And I, and this is a good beginning. That's a good start for those, uh, for the, those that never practice rotational grazing. And then as they go, they can fine tune it. And therefore they have a much better sophisticated rotational grazing. Um, so the take home message of uh, what I said is uh, the overgrazing is, and as you can see, this is, um, this is in Hadley. And uh, as you can see, the, the, the beautiful houses around there, and these guys are really polluting the environment. So the take home, the take home message from this brief presentation is the overgrazing is the, um, the scene of the scenes, is the first enemy of the environment not only in the environment, but also to the economics of the farm, productivity. And uh, so with that, so I, I just start, uh, I, I just try to give a very brief, uh, um, a few important tips, uh, knowing that some of you guys may have some questions. Increasing engagement with farmers in rotational grazing. A lot of farmers think it's extra work. Um, I do agree. Um, I do agree. It requires extra, extra work, but um, mm -hmm. but it's it's a, maybe it's a, a little bit problematic at the very beginning, but once they fine tune uh, the grazing period and that sort of thing, um, it's not going to be as bad as they think, um, and it pays off. Honestly, it pays off, and they get way more. Um, forage from the pasture uh, compared with the non non rotational. Um, it comes with uh, all kinds of benefits, environmental benefits, uh, the, uh, uniform depositing manure, um, soil health, uh, all of those things. Uh, so at the end of the day, it really pays off and some extra. And remember that we don't have to rotate them every day. Um, we can. I mean, the farmer can choose, um, there is a calculation, of course, I'm, I didn't talk about that calculation today, but there is a calculation and the farmer can decide if he wants to, if he or she wants to rotate the animals every day 
or every two days or every three days or every four days. Um, so uh, for lactating animals, we, uh, we usually uh, recommend one or two days, not more than two days. But for other animals, you can, you can choose four days, five days as long as you have enough land for the number of animals. So it's not like every day, uh, rotating every day. And uh, changing the fence, the temporary fence, to move the animals from one section to another section roughly takes about 10 to 15 minutes. So I think it's really worth it to spend 10, 15 minutes uh, to, to change, the, change the ropes or whatever fence we are using and get a lot of benefit out of that. Okay, thank you. Uh, in the interest of moving along, we are starting to get a little behind schedule here.